Good evening and welcome back to our study of the minor prophets and this week as we're going to continue through uh, Zechariah we're going to be uh, going through chapter 4 and chapter 5 so let's grab your Bibles open up to the book of Zechariah it's actually the second to last book in the Old Testament and let's see what the Lord has for us you know personally for myself I hope uh, you, you know, as you, you and I have been going through this, through the Minor Prophets, I hope that you've been um, gleaning or asking the Holy Spirit to show you how you can improve your walk with God as we go through the God's people's journey, uh, as, you know, as, they, as they've gone through some stuff in their lives, you know, how we can see, okay, well, you know, this is where God had answered them, you know, and then, you know, and, and look at, you know, God can answer me this, you know, and not in the same way, but God can answer me, you know, and how can we can improve our lives, you know, and has our walk deepened, though, with God, with the Holy Spirit, you know, even in this time where we're, even now with, the, you know, what we're going through, each day, you know, is it a battle for us to talk to the Holy Spirit, or listen to the Holy Spirit, or hear what the Holy Spirit has been saying, and I, and I hope you've been, and I hope that all of you have been, uh, we'll say, growing in faith, and deepening your relationship with Jesus Christ. You know, I have enjoyed the endless, or I've enjoyed to see the endless love that God has for his people and he cares for us also, and that he shows that love so many different ways. You know, and see, it's it's, it's easy though today, even today, to grab your Bible, to start, you know, systematically, verse by verse. It's easy to say, we're going to go through the minor prophets because the Bible, um, a lot of times you just don't you don't have to wait on the Lord. People don't wait on the Lord. They just teach what the Bi the Bible is saying. You know, because the Bible does teach itself and you know, and sometimes we get in the routine of that. But you know, we need to be in a place that first we wait on the Lord. We pray. We wait on him. Kind of kind of because we do sermons, you know, pastors and people can who who are uh, ministers or who people who just um they teach the word of God whether they're just a, even just a teacher or at work that, you know, you can have a predetermined sermon set up, you know, but a lot of times we need to be waiting on the Lord to hear what he says so it's a fresh word. There's been a lot of times I've had sermon series uh, written out. I had my sermon all done, all prepared, and it's almost like at the last hour, the, Lord, uh, the Holy Spirit says, we're changing what you're preaching on today. Um, that's, you know, that's what we want. We want a fresh word from God. And it's easy, though, sometimes to, get, to go just through the motions of just reading your Bible, you know, getting it done, and missing God through the whole thing. And, you know, as we read through the Zechariah, are you reading it and then I say, okay, Lord, I, I need you to speak to me in this matter. You know, tell me, you know, tell me what, I, what I'm missing. It's kind of like this, you know, a lot of times in, in the beginning of the year, people will, will set up a... Um, a New Year's resolution, and a lot of people will will say, you know what, we're going to start working out. We'll start getting eating healthier. We'll, you know, we'll, we'll do this and that. And then, like, if you start lifting weights or working out, you begin to use muscles that you haven't used in a long time. And when and, and it's a good sore though, because when you when you feel those muscles are sore, you're saying, well, you can see your strength in those muscles. But also though, when we weigh in on the Lord, this is where we're strengthening our muscles of faith, trusting in faith. Trusting that he's going to answer you. Stretching you. Stretching your ten pegs. And when you wait in the Lord, he will get you to use your spiritual muscles that you haven't used in a while. And you get stronger in the Lord. And his Holy Spirit is your coach. Come on, come on. You know, when you, if you go to a gym and you if you watch a program by gym or whether you do whatever exercise you do, when you have someone saying, come on, come on, when you're ready to give up. See, the Holy Spirit is though, when we're ready to give up here on earth, the Holy Spirit is saying spiritually, come on, come on, come on. It's time to get moving. It's time to get moving. It's time to get moving. And sometimes we do get in the routine of things. So be careful. As, you know, even as we go through the systematics of, you know, verse by verse, and, you know, we go through what God was saying to, his, to, his, to the people at that time. What is God saying for you today? And that's when you need the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is your coach. So we're in Zechariah, the fourth chapter. And, and guess what this chapter is about? It's about the Holy Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit. And... You know, it also be touching on resting in God, allowing Him to be the power in your life. But what does God have going on in your life today? Before we even dive into this, you know, what are some of the projects that God is building or having you build in your life? Are you 
um, building relationship with him? Are you building faith with him? Uh, are you building hope and, or perseverance or even patience? You know, these are things that God has us working on every day. But no matter what building project God has you on in your life, something that you're working on, maybe it's the way you talk or the way you act, the way you walk, you know, it's going to require us to rest in the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the people of Judah at this time were in the book of Zechariah, were building the temple. We know that from, from Haggai, and we know that even with touching base a little bit in Ezra. And that was their building project. But we have, we have spoken in Haggai, and we touched on Ezra, like I said. And we noticed that they, they have met some opposition, some adversity, and they stopped to it for a season until God sent Haggai. And he told them God wants them to get back to work on the temple. And he said, you know, they got a little bit laid back. They pulled back, and they justified it by saying, God is not in this because of the opposition or the adversity that we're facing. So we stopped. And a lot of times in our lives, God puts us on projects, and we know that God sent us on these projects, but yet when adversity comes, we're like, well, is God really in this? When things get really hard in life, well, I don't think God wants me to go this direction in my life. In some cases, that may be that may be well. You know, sometimes we... We, you know, we misread God, and God says, I want you to do this, but yet we take it in another direction. God says, no, 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 I didn't tell you to go this way. And maybe he sets up a roadblock so you can't go that way because he wants to put you on the right path. And when Haggai comes in, and they say, okay, Haggai says, let's get going, guys. We, gotta start, we, start, we have to start building the temple. And like them, God wants us to use those spiritual muscles of faith. There's going to be times in our lives when we face adversity, even today, and we want to make sure, you know, we stand in faith with opposition. It takes faith to see God's plan unfold in our lives. Listen, we're going to rile the enemy up when we start doing what God's asked us to do. He's going to, get, he's going to be upset. And God is telling them, listen, build your faith. I'll give you strength. You'll have hope. You're going to grow. You're going to move forward. And you'll walk with me. Because if we're not moving forward, we're normally moving backwards. Even if we feel that we're stagnant, we're not going anywhere. You're still coasting backwards. So we're going to look at a couple things before we get into the text. Do you remember the two main figures at the time? Zerubbabel and Joshua. Remember now, both of them we're talking about probably in the next couple chapters. Now, Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel was credited with uh, building the temple here. It's called Zerubbabel's Temple. He was, if you remember, from the Davidic descendant who was, uh, who was in purpose in this time, where he worked, he was considered a civil leader, but it was like almost like a governor of that territory. Now, these two godly men who were wanting to work for the Lord, they're hearing the voice of the Lord through listening to what Haggai is saying. And we had seen that God's own people there still had concerns or temptations of doing things for the Lord, but they were doing it in their own strength and not his. And this is true for even us today. See, we can read, we can draw near to God, we can spend time in prayer, we can read the Word, or even have fellowship with other believers, but we can even do that in our flesh. So we must be careful. Building relationships in our marriages, in our homes, can be done in the flesh and not in the Spirit. And God is saying, do it with the Holy Spirit. And anything God asks us to do, we can choose to do it in the flesh or the Spirit. Now remember also Joshua was the high priest. He was the spiritual leader. So remember those two guys as we go through this. But whenever we walk in the flesh, we do what Abraham did. Remember Abraham? Remember the promised child with Sarah? Remember Sarah laughed about it. You know, I'm getting old. I can't have a baby. This is getting insane. See, they couldn't wait on God and, and his timing. So Sarah gave good old Abe over to her servant Hagar. And Ishmael was born. And Sarah justified herself by saying, well... I can raise him like my own. See, doubt came into Sarah. And she was saying, I am old. The baby factory it wasn't working. It was broken. And she chose to walk in the flesh instead of the spirit. Now, Abraham was called a man of faith, but he chose to walk in the flesh in this. And their decision caused Israel heartache, even to this day. Like us, when we cause Ishmael's, it can last for a long time. It takes God to bring a child of promise, not us. If they would only waited just a, as just another season, they could have seen God is faithful in everything he says he'll do. Because you remember, Isaac was born. Jacob was born. God's people started to fill, fulfill through the promises of the 12 tribes. See, when we walk in the flesh, we create Ishmael's. 
We have to be careful in our walk with God. God is going to give Zachariah a beautiful uh, visualization of a word of walking in his power. So let's go into chapter 4 of Zechariah, uh, verse 1. It says, The angel who talked to me came to me, woke me like a man who was waking out of his sleep. Now you can look at it this two ways. Was he in a, like a physical sleep or a spiritual sleep? We see that this is not a dream because Zechariah is wide awake physically and the angel wants him to also spiritually, hey, wake up, don't get distracted, focus on me, focus on what I'm about to say to you, pay attention. You, you, you really can see that, hey, listen, like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. You know, sometimes we just go through the motions in life and we, we become almost like in a stupor. And we don't really cohere what's going on spiritually around us. We can see physical stuff, but not spiritual stuff. And he's saying, listen, wake up. In verse 2, he says to me, or he says, says to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold a lampstand of gold with a bowl on the top of it, seven lamps on it, and with, the lamp, with lips on each of the lamps that are at the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other is the left. Now, whether the lampstand is here that Zachariah is seeing in the vision is like a, a menorah, ever see a menorah? Or maybe it's a different shaped lampstand. We really don't know. But the lamp was something that was continually lit to represent God's presence in the temple. And one of the jobs of the priest was to make sure that, that the lamp was always lit. But replenishing the oil for the lamp was continual. So that people know that, that God is with his people. And that it was a reminder that um, his people, uh, God is with you. This basically is what it meant. And Zechariah, Zechariah sees this amazing situation where the lampstand with the bull has a uh, like a reservoir to keep oil above it. And he sees two olive trees. So we understand that they burn olive oil with these lampstands. And they did, it, they did something to the oil so that it would burn for the lamps. In the vision, Zechariah sees two trees piping this olive oil into this reservoir. And the reservoir is connected to the lampstand, continually feeding the olive oil and keeping it continually lit. Now, there was no priest having to look in after the oil to fulfill it. It's replenishing by the two olive trees. This is an interesting vision that Zechariah is seeing. And then you think about it, Zechariah is kind of puzzled when he reads verse 4. It says, And I said to the angel who has talked to me, What are these things, my Lord? And the angels who um, said or who, who talked to me with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. And he said, then he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel. <clears throat> Babel. Stop there for a minute and listen and hear what the angel is saying. I have showed you a vision. You didn't get it. This is the word of the Lord, and I have given it to you in a picture form, and now I'm giving it to you in a, in a form of uh, verbally. Remember, Zerubbabel is, is building the temple, and here's the message. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. The picture God is giving to Zechariah is concerning the building of the temple and all the things God has asked them to do, to oversee, relating to the building, is that the work, is this is a work of my spirit. This is not the work of your cleverness or your intellect, your strength. This is the work of the Lord. And this is what God is saying, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. This is how my work is to be done. For Even for us today, regardless of what we are doing or what we are going through, the same is for them back then. Now, think about this. Doesn't this happen for salvation? It's not by might, and it's not by my power, but it's by God's spirit. See, when we get saved, when you give your heart to Christ, what happens? It's by His Holy Spirit. We couldn't save ourselves. Did we save ourselves by our own power and might? No. Can I save myself by being a good person? No. I am not going to, you know, when we think about, oh, I'm not going to sin today, and God will accept me because I didn't sin. Nope. It's by God's Spirit and us surrendering our hearts. Not one of us today can say this. Salvation comes on. Listen, not one of us can say that we've earned our salvation. Salvation comes only through Jesus Christ, the finished work on the cross, and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The Spirit drew us. He opened our hearts and began to understand these things. 
And he brought people and circumstances across our path to help us, to put the pieces together, together to help us have the ability to have faith to believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and that we accepted Christ. Faith is a work of God. Understand that. And when we gave our heart to Christ, the Holy Spirit did his work. He begins to do our work. As he dwells within our heart, he's the one that's inside of us. Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit that we are saved. Meaning God's. It's not, it's not a work of you or those things we bring to God, but it's by his Holy Spirit. God wants uh, to be our power. He wants to be our, he wants to be, wants us to grab, grab his strength. Um, he wants us to be the best husband. He wants us to be the best wife. He wants us to be the best child, the best worker, the best student, the best friend, the best co-worker, yeah, the best parents, the best grandparents, the best witness. Whatever God is asking us to do in our lives, he wants us to do not by our flesh, but he wants us to do it through his Holy Spirit. Coming closer to him, getting things in order in our lives. Like even when the Holy Spirit comes into our lives, he wants to bring, um, he wants to bring, order into where it's chaos you know maybe our tongues out of control maybe our thoughts our finances whatever it may be he wants to put an order in our lives and it comes from the holy spirit first corinthians 14 33 says for god is not a god of confusion but a god of peace or but of peace and as in all churches of the saints listen it's funny though paul puts this first he puts the fruit of the order last paul put the fruit of order of last peace when your home is in order there is peace. Husbands, when your wife is happy, there is peace. Uh, even with your thoughts, your marriages, your work, and your finances. As Christians, when we invite the Holy Spirit into our lives, He brings order into chaos. He knocks on the doors of our lives and says, we need to fix these things. You know, like growing up. How many of us had a mother who wanted to clean your room? But you liked your room the way it was, right? You liked it messy. You liked toys on the floor or your clothes on the floor or whatever it may be. You liked it the way you want. You put things in the, in, the, in the perspective the way, this is what I want here, this is what I want here. And see, when, you know, and we would keep mom out of our bedroom at any cost because we didn't want her to mess up our lives or mess up our room. We are like that with the Holy Spirit. You know, he comes in and, and it's like this. And he's saying, do you mind me coming in to fix this in your areas of your life? Can I fix this in your marriage? Can I fix this in your finances? Can I fix this in your study time? Can I fix this with this with your relationships? But it's interesting. God is not um, he, does, he He's not forceful. He won't force Himself on us. But God is gracious, and He does not. And he, He's tender hearted. And He's saying, "I want to bring peace and in, peace into your life, and I want to clean up your life." And this is the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And will we be willing to allow Him to do what He's called us to do? And even as they build this temple, they're thinking. You know, we, we, we're going to design, we're going to do this, we're going to do this. And God's saying, no, no, no. This temple is by the work of the Holy Spirit. And you just have to follow this to say. Because a lot of times what happens is this. is In verse 7, it goes on and says, Who are you, a great mountain, before Zerubbabel? You shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amidst the shouts of grace. Grace to it. Now, this is God speaking to the problem, looking at this big task of building the temple. Now, think about this, how, you know, how they used to build the things back in. It can be overwhelming. It can be overwhelming lifting those big stones. It can be even like taking us way out of the, uh, off, the con uh, off of maybe a rabbit trail. But look at the, the, the pyramids. That's a big task. You know, and here they are. They're building a pyramid. They're building a temple for God. And maybe, Zer maybe they, Zerubbabel was feeling kind of overwhelmed. And when we feel overwhelmed, um, you know that the Holy Spirit is the one that wants to give you that peace to bring things in order. What causes you to be overwhelmed? You know, it's interesting because he says this. It's God speaking here. It says, who are you, O great mountain? This is God, the creator, speaking to your situation. Who are you? I'm the creator of the universe. See, God wants to come in and to do the work that's needed. And he's not asking us to do anything. You know, I'll take care of the problems that you're facing. Watch and see what I can do. We don't want to, we don't want to get stuck. We don't want to get stuck. We don't want to get, you know, with this, allow God to do what he wants to do. And when we allow God in our lives, he's saying, listen, who are you, O great mountain? What are you? 
I'm the Lord God of the universe, and nothing is too difficult for me to deal with. What are you facing even today? As they were facing building the temple, what are you facing today? It maybe seems so, I don't know, too big for handle. How many of us have said, well, God can't handle this? God can handle anything. How often do we lose sight of this and that, that God, who God is, and that he can deal with anything that we face? We need to stand in faith to believe that he, not us, he will get us through and let him decide what the ending is. You know, sometimes when we maybe we have no food in the table. And you're like, Lord, I'm, I'm hungry and the kids are hungry. We need to be in a place, and it's a hard place to be in, because there, there's times that I've been in that place, is when we say, okay, God, I know you're going to provide. I don't know what you're going to provide, but I know you're going to provide. And, and in trusting in him, say, okay, here it is. And whatever comes in, we're grateful for it. Don't define faith in what I want, but in what God will do as I stand with him, not knowing what he's about to do. God is not a vending machine. Faith is not knowing what God will do, but we trust in him anyhow. You know, there's, I didn't want to, you know, I just, uh, we'll move on. Like growing up as a child, you you just went wherever you were when your parents told you. You know, a lot of times when I was a kid, my mom and dad used to like they used to call it bumming around. So they used to take all the kids, all my brothers and sisters, and we used to get in the in the, in the station wagon at the time. We had a station wagon, and they would take us to the store or the mall. We didn't care. We trusted in my parents that wherever they were going to take us, that they would take care of us. So why is it so hard for us to trust in God when in life's journey we don't necessarily know where we're heading, but you know God's driving the vehicle or God has your hands. See, if we only had to live our lives with God like this here, you know, God direct me, guide me, and I will, f and I will follow. And, you know, here's my hand, God, take me where I need to go. And what needs done in my life, I trust you. Now think about that. All the times that we've gone places with children, um, the great unknowns, but yet we trusted our parent, but yet we struggle with God. And as we finish verse 7, it says, Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and it shall bring forth forward a top stone and a shout of grace, grace to it. The top stone, or maybe yours says capstone, of the temple of God is saying, it, this will get done. This, this is a work that will be finished because... It's something that I want done. Verse 8 says, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands have also completed. So you know it's going to get done, and who's going to, get, who's going to finish it? Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised this day of small things shall, re shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand, to hand of Zerubbabel. You know, sometimes we get old, sometimes in, in my life, even my life, so use me, uh, we got impatient wondering when God was going to finish what he started, his work. And when, when will ever get done? Maybe you have time, maybe you can think about some times when you're like, come on God, are you, is this, when's this going to happen? Many times in my life, you know, and we think about even like Abraham, he had to wait, what, 25 years? And, you know, <laughs> we want, we want, we're a microwavable society where we want everything right now. But during the time of them even building this temple was a time of growth for them spiritually. And even when we're waiting for God to answer our prayers or have something that this work done in our lives, we are growing step by step, day by day, day, day by day, week by week, week by year by year, whatever, however long it took. See, we complain when things are not going fast enough and know that, listen, God is working. And God says, the Zerubbabel will finish this temple. He says, These seven are the eyes of the Lord, which range through the whole earth. You can look back a little earlier in the vision, it says seven lights. In verse, seven, or verse 11, it says this, Then I said to him, What are these two olive trees in, uh, on, the, on the right and on the left of the lampstand? And the second time I, and I answered and said to him, What are these two branches of the olive trees, which are besides the two golden pipes? from which the golden oil is poured out. Now notice the change here. Remember he says, 
which is what are these two olive trees on the right and the left? The second time I answered, he said, then what are these two branches of the olive trees? He changes the question, what are these branches on either side of the lampstand? And what are the pipes for? Let's continue real quick. And he said to me, do you not, do you not know what these are? And I said, no, my Lord. And he said, these are the two anointed ones who stand by the Lord of the whole earth. Now, in Zechariah days, it was Joshua and Zerubbabel. They were the anointed men. He sees the trees, but he looks closer and he notices the branches. Now, when you think about this, are you not a branch? If you go to John 15, you can read that on your own personal time. About abiding in, in the Lord. But we are also the branches that are grafted in. And notice that the oil is continually pouring because of the feed from the tree. And the branches pour forth the oil, and the light is continually being lit among them. But let that let that sink in a little bit. God's Spirit is being continually there with them, and His Spirit is working among them, and seeing a continual flow from these two men. God has called. I have called these men, and I am anointing them to do it. My Spirit will not stop flowing to them, my spirit is moving. Now, most of us know in the Old Testament, the oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit that will continually flow. Now, here's where you go back to, if you go think about it, go back to John 15. As we are abiding in the vine, or as we are connected to the tree, meaning that we're connected to Christ, the Spirit of God's His presence will flow out of us continually. And we spill over of His Spirit. We overflow with His Spirit. You know, rivers of living water will come out from us. Now, Jesus uses a different uh, set of oil. He uses rivers of living water. Jesus uses a different metaphor than Zechariah is using. Now, John 15 says, abiding in the vine, are you filled or are you empty? Because a lot of times Christians are, if, if we're not, if the Holy Spirit's not pouring out of us, that means we're dry. So why are we dry? We need to go in and get connected to the right vine or the right tree so that we get filled with the Holy Spirit. We need to be living our lives with the Holy Spirit. And a lot of churches today don't necessarily talk about the Holy Spirit. If you're in one of those churches, I would suggest you would start looking for a church that talks about the Holy Spirit and how He is um, an utmost importance in every believer's life. Because if you're a believer in Christ, that means the Holy Spirit resides inside of you. And we need to be letting the Holy Spirit out. And that's why He, and that's how we make it through life, because He's the one that coaches us, He's the one that counsels us, He's the one that leads us, is the Holy Spirit. It's important that we understand the value of the Holy Spirit and who He is in every believer's life. The Holy Spirit's like this, and maybe you've heard this before, but whenever you're thirsty, you come on, you turn the faucet on at your house, you fill the cup up, the water comes out, you fill it up. The faster, the more you turn the knob, the water comes out. It's the same thing with us. The more we allow the Holy Spirit to flow, the more of God comes out of us. See, Zechariah is prophesying to those who have returned from exile. They have come back with a lot of materialism habits, um, and God will address this. Like, you think about all the years they have been, you know, all the years they've been in captivity. So, you know, you're in a culture and you begin to pick up all the different things, the cultic practices, the worldly ways. Now, now, and they brought those all back from there. And, you know, a lot of times, even in us, how long, you know, even as believers, some like, no, some believers, you know, some of you may have been, say, were born into the family, kind of raised as a Christian, and maybe some of you came in later life. You know, how much of that garbage did we have of the world that, that has to get out of our lives? And how much is still there that needs to get out of our lives? And, and this is what God, the work that God is, gonna, is doing to his people because now he's bringing them back. He's bringing them back to build the temple. <clears throat> but they brought back a lot of luggage with them. So let's go to chapter 5. Chapter 5 starts out, it says, A vision with a flying scroll. So that would be an interesting picture to see a flying scroll. But it says in verse 1, it says, Again, I have lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. Interesting interesting picture that he's, that he's seeing. 
And he said, what do you see? And I, and I answered, I see a flying scroll. It's lengthy and it's 20 cubics and its width is, is 10 cubics. Then he said to me, this is the, the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land. For everyone who steals shall be clean, cleaned out according to, to what is on one side. And everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what's on the other side. And I will send out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name. And it shall remain in the house, consume it, both timber and stone. Well, God is saying here that I am about to do a cleansing work on my people, even as we came to Christ. Know that there had to be the old thoughts, the old ways had to be pulled out of our lives. And that's where the chaos and the, and the, and the storms come in our lives because we're always, we're always fighting with the Holy Spirit. But it says, my word will be brought forth. And this is the picture Zechariah gets from the word of God. My word will uh, get this garbage out of their lives or destroy their homes. Now, either when you hear the word of the Lord, it will either help you and clean you or it will cause you to reject. It's going to do one or the other. The word of God is... If we truly open it, will help us or cause us to reject God. Eventually, God will confront us about our lives if we're not following Him the way He wants. If we confess Christ truly in our hearts, God will, God will have the Holy Spirit say, "Okay, we need to clean this out." And it goes back to you know, are we willing to surrender to Him? And you know, all He wants to do is come in and make us right with Him. All He wants to do is help us. But eventually, God will confront all of us about our lives. And how we live uh, for him. But this is what's happening just in the first four verses that he says, I will deal with I will deal with it. Then it says, A vision of a woman in a basket. Verse 5. Then the angel who talked to me came forward and said to me, Lift your eyes and see what this is going out. And I said, What is it? And he said, This is a basket that's going out. And he said, This is their iniquity in all the land. Now there were there were measuring there were baskets that were made of certain sizes to measure uh, ephah of something. He's saying, "I am weighing, I am measuring out the sin of the land." Remember, God has has just scales. He says, "And behold, um, the leaden co the leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the in the basket." And he said, "This is wickedness." And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. Now wickedness here can be seen as the harlot, kind of like mentioned in the uh, the book of Revelation. Verse 9. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was the wind was in their wings, and they had wings like the wings of a, of a stork. And they lift and they and they lifted up the baskets between the earth and heaven. Then I said to the angel who talked to me, Where are they taking the basket? And he said to me, To the land of Shinar, a Shinar, to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down on its base. Shinar or Babylon. He said Hebrew is the set the word set on that part means in Hebrew means a like a, a pedestal or one who place an idol or a false god. God is confronting the people of Israel uh, with what they were practicing. Remember now. They were brought back after 70 years of captivity. So there were some old ways of acting, some old ways of behaving. That God says, I have to clean this. This You can't be. You can't walk in this defilement. Remember, even though they're in the Holy Land, does not make them holy. And there's things in their lives that, that God had to work out. Just like the same things in our life. Just because we come to church doesn't mean we have it all together or we're in a good place. Every time we come to church, God wants to, to, us to remove the things that are not of Him. Or the things that are, have been holding us back, like sins, iniquity, just bad practices that we have. You know, even in this time, God has, even for me, been finding tuning some of the things that have been going on in my mind, in my heart, in my thoughts. You know, listen, we got to, you know, let's, let's bring it back over, you know. And, you know, even with a lot of different people, like, like yesterday, I went to, had to, had to do some things at, at, at the store, and there was just so much, uh, fear there was just so much people just even even the, some of the ways they were even shopping some of the ways they were treating other people and it was just it was weird that people would treat other people that way you know and, but they're acting a lot of fear and you know 
as we continually face or walk with God, our Christian heart and, and our hearts, as we begin to hear the Word of God, you know, we begin to see in our lives where things need to be taken away. And God will, will judge our sins, and, and He takes them away. Um, he purges things from our lives that hurt, you know, and there's things in our lives that the Holy Spirit is, is trying to get rid of our lives, but we hold on to them. But see, God is doing the moving. God is the one who wants to do the things. Because it says, it says, when I lifted my eyes and I saw, and behold, two women coming forward, the wind was at their wings, and they had wings like wings of a stork, and they lifted up the baskets between the heaven and the earth and the heaven. And we need to surrender to God completely in our lives. You know, you, you think about, you know, even, you know, even when we think about when we go back to the branch part, that we, even Jesus says, rivers of living water will flow from us. And, and as believers, like, we came out of a, of a world of captivity. When we lived in the world, we were captive to that. And when, God, when Jesus set us free and we gave our hearts to Christ, he grafted us in. And then now we have a new uh, feeding source. So, you know, we're used to the feeding off the world, but now we have to feed off the off of Christ. And it's important that we graft into Christ and not into the world. Because when we graft off to Christ, our bodies will be healthier, in a sense, spiritual healthier. And that we'll be able to, to and, and be able to serve him and, 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 and to do, and get some of these old ways out of our lives. You know, we want living water to come out of us. We want people to see Christ in us so that we can help others. But as, if, if we're trying to tap into two different places, what happens is our, our is we get tainted. Our, what comes out of us is, is, is sour. It's not what, what God wants for us. You know, and are you abiding in the vine? Are you filled with God's Spirit? Or are you empty? You know, even in this time where we're, you know, dealing with this corona thing, it can draw a lot of other people and can make people feel overwhelmed. But even as we just wrap up chapter 4 and chapter 5 tonight, you know, God is saying to, to, to the people, I, it's, it's going to be me. This is a work of God, and I want this done. And it's not going to be by your strength. It's going to be by my strength. It's not going to be by your power. It's going to be my power, says the Lord of hosts. And just like in every believer's life, and just like in God's people's lives, God wants to clean out of us those things that would hurt us, hinder us, or stop the flow of God's Spirit in our lives. We just have to be in a place that we are willing to say, God, you're free to clean, do whatever needs to be done. Zechariah gets the word of God, and he says, my word will get this garbage out of their lives. Meaning God's word, the holy, the Bible. When we read the word of God in, in the holy, in the holy, we listen to what the Holy Spirit says. It will clean us out, but we have to be willing to let Him do it. Like I said earlier, we just need to, to surrender to God completely and trust in Him as we go through this next journey in our lives, and know when God has called us to do something. That if there's adversity, don't quit and say, this is not of God. Because if God had told you to do something, know that the enemy is going to be upset and he'll try to stop you in whatever God has asked you to do. Simply, you keep on persevering, you keep on pushing, and you keep on asking the Holy Spirit, I need your guys, I need your help. Well, that's it for tonight. It'll be a short, quick one. Uh, continue reading on your own. And, and if you have any questions, just ask. Have a great night. Be blessed. And Lord willing, we'll see you next Wednesday. Bye now.